All right, so um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us to this um, um, math uh, colloquia meeting of today. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker. Oh, thanks for joining us, uh, Lars Rutofto from Emory University in Atlanta. Um, uh, just very few words. Uh, on, on this, like, um, career, he, he did his PhD in Münster in Germany in 2000. Uh, 12, he obtained it, and then after a, a postdoc at British Columbia, he joined the Department of Math and Computer Science at Emory, where he is now associate professor. And uh, he has done uh, some um, very, to my opinion, interesting, uh, uh, among uh, definitely many other subjects, some recent work on uh, the interface between uh, scientific computing, numerical computing, and uh, and uh, deep learning uh, and uh, and that is uh, uh, as, far, as far as I can guess uh, going to be the main uh, topic of the lecture of today so before giving the word to Lars I would just like to remind everybody that we are recording the talk just uh, just out of uh, information and that also though that we nevertheless we would like to keep the presentation somewhat um, informal. So if you have questions, you're very welcome to, for example, use the chat or uh, try to, to ask questions during the talk if it is a reasonable, a reasonable time for doing that. And of course, uh, have a, a discussion at the end of the, uh, of the talk. All right, so um, without any further ado, please, Lars, uh, thanks again for, for, your, uh, yeah, for accepting our invitation. Yes, sure. So thanks, um, Francesco, for the kind introduction and for the op opportunity to speak here. I really enjoy, you know, typically coming to Italy, but, uh, you know, this way I think we'll make it work just as well. Um, I'm happy to have an opportunity to, to speak exactly to this audience, and I hope my, my kind of talk will, will sort of tailored to the interest currently at GSSI um, and around. Um, and uh, as uh, Francesco said, uh, I really like um, to interact in these in these Zoom talks. Um, so just so everyone knows, uh, on this screen, I have all of the, you have videos who have videos on. I can see them there. I can see the chat window, and uh, I, I'll try to uh, take questions as I go if there are any, or later is fine as well. But it's really, I think, hopefully, a great opportunity for for you know new for you to learn more about the work that we've been doing here. That I'm going to survey a little bit for you, but also for me to get to know what what you are working on and maybe find 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 things to talk more about. Um, and yeah, so let's let's jump right into the talk. And I chose kind of to start with uh, PDEs and show you how PDEs can be applied in deep learning. Um, that's kind of uh, the mission for the next 45 minutes or so. And just before we do this, I want to get, get some common appreciation that I want to share about what this whole thing is all about uh, what, or what is the core of science in some sense. Because I think whatever you are working on right now, whatever we've been working on in the past and are doing right now, we try to understand the world through models and through data. So these are two components that uh, make applied math and computational math, I think, a really fun place to be in. And you see really two very different paradigms on my first slide. Um, so there is this uh, deep learning paradigm where, that I'm kind of sketching you here on the left with uh, just one prototypical application. And um, bas basically, uh, to give you a, a sense, if you haven't uh, heard about uh, how too many details, um, the task is, so can you understand the world in the sense that I give you an image, a photograph, and you tell me what's in the image. So now if you think of, from a perspective of modeling, that is an extremely difficult task that is very hard to even think about writing down a mathematical model. So in that realm, this deep learning revolution, how it's called, or deep learning um, paradigm has emerged over the last uh, few decades as being a really tough competitor, even out outperforming some humans, uh, or most humans, for sure me, I would ne never have guessed what type of dog that would be. Um, so how does that work? Uh, you take a model uh, depicted here um, as a deep neural network, uh, which is a very flexible class of models. It has no physics background. It can pretty much model anything if trained with enough of training images. So you have a bunch of labeled images. In this case, it's about 14 million plus. 
um, and uh, in some way with you know statistical methods or computational methods optimization and so on you manage to uh, obtain a model that classifies this image which was not part of the 14 million that's a new image so that's an incredibly success story that uh, we have seen that we don't fully yet understand how they work when they work and when they don't work on the other hand I think uh, you, this application will also resonate with me because it's a, it's a colleague of mine who's actually quite close to, to where you are at. And we have Alex here, of course. Um, uh, it's a very different paradigm if you think about understanding the world through PDE models. So in a PDE model, so think about the, the, um, the decision making in, in clinics where you have a patient and you want to understand uh, which coronary stent you want to implant into the patient. Uh, before actually doing the surgery and you have different options, um, the, the paradigm works so differently. And uh, I think I want to start with, with a fully, full appreciation of, of the differences here. So what you can do here is actually you can kind of uh, align the stent with the, with the patient and then do simulations uh, with, uh, you know, fluid dynamics uh, type, of, type, of, uh, type of methods. And what this allows you to do actually is something incredible. You have maybe one to three data points of a, of a patient, like one to three images that you take, maybe post, pre, post surgery, and then different modalities. And with only those three images, you can build a patient specific model. And um, that is en enabled only by lots of mathematics and lots of advances in that area. Um, and I think you also have a few few things that you don't have in the deep learning paradigm because you can analyze uh, the PDE model, you can understand it and get really detailed info. Okay, so th these two paradigms, I, I, my research tries to blend because I think about this not as extremes, but I think about it as a slider um, where you have on the on the left hand side you have the deep learning paradigm which relies mostly on data and very little on modeling. And then on the other extreme, you have the PDE world where you have a very strong model and a few data points and you can uh, do predictions and, and gain some understanding about uh, what you're investigating. But those sliders, you can move them actually. And I think in, in recent years, we have seen many nice applications where um, people have, uh, for example, used data to augment PDE or to augment physical models that are incompletely described. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is uh, to basically um, move the slider of deep learning a little bit to the right, to the PDE world. Um, but, and building these connections, I think, is a very fruitful and, for me, very exciting area of, of research these days. So to get vocabulary straight, I'd like also quickly saying what is deep learning. Um, deep learning is a field of artificial intelligence within the, within the subset of machine learning algorithms. Deep learning has been emerged uh, in, in recent years as one of the, the very successful type of, of methods. Um, if uh, you are, you're new to deep learning and are interested, there's a beautiful paper um, by, by, the, by uh, Hayem and my Hayem and Hayem or, um, in uh, Siam Review that really uh, is a very good, is tailored to applied mathematicians and gives a very nice introduction to this field. Uh, so we should not forget forget that there are also other machine learning algorithms, of course, around, and AI is a bigger field than machine learning as, 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 as per se. Um, but uh, I want to put us on the map, and we are only going to talk about deep learning today um, in, in this talk. Um, I want to also, when you compare this to the PDE world, just make, an, make a note that deep learning is not, so, not as new as you may think, uh, or some of you may think, because um, kind of uh, deep neural networks, I think, have been around since the 1950s. And, uh, the research uh, in AI, unlike in, in applied math and PDE, where there was constant interest and uh, probably constant gain of knowledge, in AI, it's kind of always going up and down over the years. So you talk about AI summers and AI winters, and definitely right now we are in, in an AI summer. Um, but that is actually some implications because um, you know you, you see some of the uh, methodologies being uh, that are sort of invented now, may, uh, there are analogs maybe from 20 years ago or so, uh, which makes it also interesting. The recent search really is mainly driven by massive data sets and computing power. And hopefully increasingly future, future advances will be, will be driven by more mathematics and more insights. Um, but that's kind of you know, my view of or my definition of, of, of deep learning. Um, that, that I want like to start with. Um, and again, like um, watching the chat window, if you have specific questions today is your, is your chance to ask. Um, 
So then what can applied and computational mathematicians do in, in deep learning? So when I talk to my colleagues in the CS department, they will probably start with a statement like this. I mean, deep learning is basically a technology. You, you take lots of data, you have something called backpropagation, you hook up your GPU server, pick a, a software package, and that, well, that will lead to success. Okay, so, so why even study the mathematics of deep learning? And I think there are many good reasons that uh, actually are also in the news because, you know, AI algorithms or, or deep learning algorithms can be biased. They're not explainable. They can fail dramatically um, and, and so on. So there is a, a big uh, need to understand why and when deep learning works and also um, finding a more mathematical notation and definition of, of, of these techniques that are out there. I think that's what's at least driving my group in this, in this area. Um, so then, and just to give the, the roadmap map, again, the main goal for today is to highlight connections between PDEs and deep learning. Um, and we are going to talk about one direction uh, today, uh, namely, how can we bring in PDEs and ODEs into deep learning to gain, get more insight, improve the efficiency and gain robustness of, of deep learning algorithms. I will say that there is also a, the reverse direction that is equally interesting, I would think. And it's actually at the moment also what, what uh, we and my, what my group and, and I are doing quite a lot is um, you can also use or think of using deep learning techniques to solve PDE problems that are seem impossible to solve. So think about the nonlinear PDE in a hundred dimensional space. Um, first of all, like that, that blows your mind in terms of where, where these things arise, but they exist. Um, and it's, a, it's, a ball, it's an area where you know, traditional numerical analysis methods or computing methods like finite element, for example, are, are inapplicable. And there is an increased uh, demand and push to use deep learning uh, in, those, uh, in those areas. And high dimensional statistics, of course, is another area where uh, you can, uh, you can uh, think about using deep learning. So that's a, that's a whole different talk that I'm not going to give, but I'm happy to chat about. Um, okay, and I break um, our, our path here into two, two chunks. So first we'll talk about the connection between ODEs and, and deep learning, and then we'll talk about uh, the PDE world pretty much standard from an applied mathematician's curriculum, I guess. Okay, um, this whole, whole work that I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, part of many years and many collaborations that I've been uh, enjoying over the past. Um, most importantly, I think uh, my collaboration with a group of Eldad Haber, where I did my postdoc and the two of us kind of got started in this business uh, in 2017. Um, making some of these connections I'm going to talk about today. With Stan Osha's group, I've recently covered the reverse direction, and then I have other collaborators along the way, Stephanie Günther, uh, who is working on computational methods for, for multigrid and, and uh, acceleration of, the, of deep neural network training, and Iran, Tristar, and Israel, actually, who I worked with on, on also these PDE-based image, uh, PDE-based deep learning uh, algorithms. So, um, that's to them, and of course, there's some funding that, that we've gotten along the way and that we're grateful for. Um, okay, so let's make the, the move between uh, deep learning and ODEs. So let's look at that. Um, so here is a, a simple example I like to, to play with and to, and to, and to start with. Um, you have a training data. If you haven't seen it, it's a supervised classification problem. Uh, you have some training data um, that are 2D points. Um, and they are labeled blue or red. And you basically want to find a function that now for every point in R2 uh, kind of gives you the color red or blue. Um, and the idea is to take those examples. So now think about the data points um, So the, uh, as examples. So they are two dimensional examples and you want to make a decision with respect to the color. So you have two inputs. That's typically how neural network uh, persons uh, describe what they're doing. Uh, they go into the neural network, then something happens in between and then you get the one number out. Uh, and that is a classification result. And I want to build this up for you um, and really walk you through the, the modeling step of, of, of this simple model, or I have a simple model to accomplish this task, because of course there are many other machine learning methods you can do. So here's your training data again. Um, so mathematically there are points in R2 that are labeled zero and one, say red and blue. And then what you do is you des describe the process of the forward propagation through the ResNet. So I'm talking I'm mainly interested in residual neural networks um, today um, because of the relation to ODEs that we will see in a second. So you, you have typically an input layer 
Uh, you take your y, you multiply it with some matrix k, and you get your first hidden feature that I'm going to denote by u. Um, and this k here can be a matrix in my case. It's a matrix that is three by two. So then um, uh, you get uh, three, three hidden variables. Um, and the matrix is going to be unknown. Uh, it's going to be learned or inferred uh, during the training. So that's, uh, you can keep tabs of what is known and what's unknown. The k in uh, for the input is, is the first unknown. So then uh, in between these, these, uh, these dotted, uh, dotted arrows here, what, what the, the idea is, is that you have more transformation. So you take the previous feature, you apply, apply an affine transformation, and then a pointwise activation function or nonlinearity to it. Uh, I've denoted here the sigma that I'm using, it's a 10H. Um, and you keep adding this with uh, some parameter H for step size to the previous feature vector. Uh, u0 and then you get your u1 you plug it in and so in those layers they are all structured equally each of them have has introduced new weights so the k naught and b naught to k n minus one to b n minus one are the new weights also so then in the very end you make your decisions so you have these three outputs and then you basically project this down into r1 and apply this uh, function s which is a soft max or a, like a sigmoid function in this case that squeezes everything between zero and one because you want to predict those labels. Okay, so if you write this now down, down uh, in terms of what are the unknowns and the, and the knowns, um, you can make a big vector theta uh, where all the weights are, are stored. You have um, the, the re resonant weights, you have the output weights, and the input can be either fixed or not fixed. Uh, sometimes you can choose this randomly or you can do other things. Um, and then the training problem, uh, boils down to solving a stochastic optimization problem that I can write down like so. So you have uh, the outputs of your model, you compare them to the given classes and have a loss function that evaluate, evaluates how well you're doing, typically a cross entropy loss. Um, and basically this expected value is you sample examples from your data set, um, typically divided into training and validation, of course, and you add some regularization to the problem and then you minimize. And of course, there is a big machinery in terms of how can you optimize uh, uh, these, these type of functions. Um, there's a nice uh, science review paper uh, by Leon Boutou um, that you can look at for, for many, uh, many of these choices. And by the way, I'm going to uh, post a link to my slides later also. So I forgot to do that in the chat. Um, so you can grab them with, with references and so on. Okay, um, the training is not so much our, our deal for today. It's a very interesting problem. Uh, we're also working on this, this a little bit, but uh, today we're really going to talk about this, this process of the forward propagation here. Okay, um, and um, let's look at uh, the discussion of ResNet. So um, when, you, when you see this written down, and I told you already that this age corresponds to a step size. Uh, first thing you notice is that this is actually a discretization of or forward Euler approximation of, of an ODE. Um, so that's uh, what, what got me started in here. Um, and this still is something really fascinating that you can, you can play with. So that is a relation between a typically discrete neural network and a continuous analog. And you can use that now to, to gain more insight and get new ideas how to solve the learning problem. ResNets have become popular though before this observation. So the ResNet uh, came about, I think in 2016 or something like that, and has uh, hundreds of thousands of citations because they work so well in different, different tasks. Um, a few other advantages have been noted over common architecture. So they uh, often improve with depth, which is not to be taken for granted. So if you add more weights, you would expect to do better, but in many traditional neural networks, you actually don't because the training problem is just incredibly hard um, and nonlinear and non-convex and so on. And you can see an example here where you have a non-resnet with many weights. And the, this is a function that you will minimize. And it's not a nice function unless you know a lot about global optimization, which could come in handy, but it's a very high dimensional global optimization problem. Um, or you can think about solving, the, uh, minimizing this function. I'm not claiming that this is necessarily an easier problem because you have very lo many local minimas too, but at least it's a smoother function. Um, and, and that uh, saves you a few uh, difficulties. Um, and um, I should say that in practice, the example I give you here, so this is how you obtain the, the ODE. 
um, in practice, the, uh, these models become a little bit more complicated and also more, more, more messy, um, especially when you talk about images. And here's a note um, I like to give also because I talked about AI winters and AI summers. In the last AI summer, there are actually some works when you now look at them, knowing what you know about ResNets and so on, they look uh, pretty, pretty similar. So um, it's actually quite remarkable to look at these, these two papers uh, from that lens. Um, Okay, so what can you do in terms of insight from, from this perspective? Uh, one thing that, that um, you know, basic question that we started asking ourselves when, when we first looked at this is uh, when, under which conditions is the forward propagation stable? And by stable, I mean that small perturbations of the input feature lead to bounded uh, in, uh, perturbations of the output feature. Okay, um, and there are many reasons why you, could, why you should care about that. Because uh, obviously, if you want to train the weights, um, the theta here again is unknown. Um, you want typically your your problem to be well posed, because um, otherwise you may run into diff difficulties in the in the optimization. Uh, you may have heard about adversarial attacks um, and and so on. So there, that's the first basic question. I think that we as applied mathematicians would ask ourselves if we say solved an inverse problem uh, for the weights of the network. Um, and uh, what we found is maybe not so surprising. Um, generally speaking, the ODE will not be stable for all choices of weights because you have to think about the dynamics, but also you have to think about all the weights being unknown and then many horrible things can happen. However, what we notice, and that's sort of also my philosophy here is that we, you know, we have this continuous viewpoint, but if you just go to the continuous world and discretize with another method, then you're not really changing the game. And the flexibility you have in deep learning is to pick your dynamical system. So if you made choices, for example, to restrict the K to be anti-symmetric, or uh, think about this, uh, think about networks that are defined by Hamiltonians, then you can actually use better time integration, like symplectic integrators, and obtain architectures that are stable for all choices of K and B. And that what we found allows you to still fit and accomplish the learning problem, but also simplify the training. Um, and um, I mean, clearly, uh, like that is uh, kind of um, uh, an experimental work that we've done on, on quite simple task first. But in the meantime, since this original work, there have been actually many extensions to, of, 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 the, of these ideas and, and I found that found more expressive architectures that are still stable and so on. So there's just an incomplete list and a growing list of, of, of some of the references here um, that this work has sparked. Um, and I think noteworthy are that now, by now also the analysis has advanced quite a lot, not by my group, but by, by other people who have uh, built up on this in terms of the convergence and also about the optimality conditions to more leverage this, con this uh, viewpoint of the continuous versus the discrete. Um, and of course, you know, different time integrators have been looked at. Um, so lots of numerical analysis work. There are nice works on optimality conditions and maximum principles in terms of training. And then uh, one, one part of our push has been to, to, uh, to take these, these te techniques and apply them to much more difficult data sets, which we've been able to do and also refine sort of the, the stability results um, that, that we have in the paper. Um, so that is, you know, one first step of how you can use this continuous viewpoint. I think uh, the most successful follow-up work that, that we have seen was uh, what's called neural ODEs. So that's now become actually a term in machine learning, which is a big achievement actually to uh, penetrate that uh, that community. Um, and um, so there was a group in Toronto who, who wrote a paper that got, won an award at, at, at NeurIPS at one day, uh, was covered in MIT Tech Review, um, and uh, really kind of uh, took, uh, made these idea now really on vogue in the machine learning community and sparked, of course, other follow-ups. Um, you know, numerically, we can, we can argue about uh, what exactly they've done, but I think the greatest achievement is that they have made this uh, popular. Uh, mathematically speaking, to give a few comments of what what's, uh, what's sort of novel idea in neural ODEs is, is that uh, you treat this learning problem now as an optimal control problem in continuous dimensions. So you have adjoint equations, you have euler Lagrange equations, and so on. Um, whereas in the typical way of solving deep learning problems, like what we would do, so we would uh, use a discretized and optimized paradigm. And there are pros and cons, which we'll get to. Um, 
And um, also this neural OD work is, is heavily cited and has sparked a lot of uh, in interesting uh, ideas. There are a few um, ways if you, if you start looking at the neural OD, uh, I would really recommend you look at the Golami paper here uh, because um, there's one claim in there that you can, uh, when you solve the adjoint equation, you realize that you need to store all the hidden features because you need them for the computation. However, and that's kind of blowing up your, your memory, especially on a GPU. And the claim in neural OD is you can recompute this by integrating the dynamical system backward in time. And that should ring a few bells here that that may not always be a great idea. Uh, here you have a paper to, to show exactly that. Um, but you know these ideas have been used actually for many successful problems. Generative modeling is one important area where neural ODEs I think are, are playing quite a role these days. Um, and yeah, so just want to put this paper in, into perspective because I believe that a few people have, have heard about that. Um, to go a bit more into detail between um, the work that my group has been doing and neural ODEs, um, it's really the two different paradigms. You, you know probably this discussion from optimal control, but optimized discretized versus discretized optimized. So I have this problem and it's governed by an ODE. Now I have two ways of solving this. I can uh, first uh, kind of derive all the optimality conditions or Lagrange equations in the continuous uh, framework and then use um, optimization methods for, uh, in continuous time. So forward and adjoint solves, adaptive time integration and so on. And it has a few nice advantages um, and to, to be in this framework. What uh, we do and also what typically is actually easier to do in machine learning uh, software is discretize optimize. So you discretize all the weights and states and time, you get a discrete problem, uh, get the derivatives through what's called backpropagation or automatic differentiation, and then you solve the problem on a discrete level. And uh, these two things I also fill a whole talk of discussing all the nuances but uh, just to show you what would actually happen in, in practice on some of these learning problems is that you can see huge speed ups uh, when you go into the second paradigm. And the reason is that in this framework in machine learning, yes, you have an ODE and like a neural ODE that is uh, describing your forward propagation, but this ODE model is not given to you by physics or by modeling or by first principles. So in some sense, uh, in optimized discretize, I would say you sort of overdo the continuous, uh, you overuse the continuous viewpoint and you are paying the in, uh, in here in terms of convergence. So you see it, uh, one example for C fact 10, where you see uh, the loss functions in blue for optimized uh, for discrete optimized goes down much quicker, and also the generalization is better, uh, and uh, and also the runtime by the way is, is very different for these. So the cost per epoch is actually much lower in the blue than it is in the red, and the reason is you you're not solving the you're not taking the ODE too seriously in this in this in this work. And um, so my advice here would be use discrete as optimized. It's easier. Uh, you know kind of what you get in terms of cost. Conversions and generalization typically are better, um, but I'm happy to, to discuss this also uh, if you have other opinions. So I want to highlight another way how you can benefit from this continuous viewpoint, and that is by using methodologies from optimal control. And one uh, work that uh, Stephanie Günther uh, has been leading uh, together with my group and a few others is to use a concept that has recently been uh, developed in optimal control, and that is called parallel in time methods. Because you realize that the forward propagation through a ResNet is a sequential process. You go from one layer to the next and so on. So in order to increase the opportunities for parallelism, the idea here is to replace this forward propagation with a parallel nonlinear multigrid iteration. So that, you know, you scratch your head because you have something that is sequential, but it's a closed form, you know, I have an explicit time stepping. And you replace it now with a multigrid that solves a nonlinear equation. Um, so clearly, in terms of flops, there's almost no hope that the second approach would work better. However, you have a few benefits here now because you can uh, simultaneously iterate on the weights and on the states and adjoints. So you don't always solve the ODE forward and backward. You kind of in the in the limit do it. It's sort of like all at once method in optimal control. Um, and you have more benefits for parallelism. And uh, what we found here is that uh, when you have about 16 cores for the examples we looked at, you're actually faster with the parallel multigrid. Um, I will say that the parallel efficiency is not so great because there is a lot of communication uh, coming along, but it's really the number of cores that are, say, very difficult to use in a normal learning 
paradigm where you do say for example stochastic gradient descent you have many small steps that don't require much computation and are not really suited for parallel computing so in that sense uh, those works um, uh, are actually an improvement um, and since we worked on this actually the efficiency also has gone up by by other works that, that i've seen and also there are now actually quite convenient software packages to do experiments with these type of methods but uh, you can sometimes really um, reduce the runtime here quite a lot. Um, and it's not so easy to parallelize the training, especially when you have very deep networks. So um, so that's the kind of the part, ODEs and, and deep learning. Um, maybe I'll, I'll stop here for just, just a second and, and then jump into the PDE world. And uh, happy to take questions uh, if people, people have any. Maybe I see Francesco now, Nicola, we're good? Yeah, we're definitely good, yeah. yeah. Okay, very, very good to know. Um, questions also, I, I, I move on. Yeah, maybe you have, hello, hi. Oh maybe yeah, you have yeah. A, a quick one. So I was curious about the convergence curve you showed before uh, in the comparison between optimized and discretized and vice versa. Yeah. So, so I'm just curious, so why the blue uh, curve is like uh, jumping? <laughs> Very good, very good question. Is, I mean, what I did some... not tell you, since I, so I, I kind of uh, talked my way out of not talking too much about optimization in the beginning, right? So you have okay. the stochastic optimization problem that you're solving. And in this uh, deep learning framework, typically people use variants of the stochastic gradient descent method. And you pick a, a fixed step size typically for these methods. And what happens here is you decide that um, for after 150 epochs, which is uh, 150 passes through the entire data set, um, you decrease the step size or also called learning rate. So what this allows you to do then is, uh, so if you think about the, the SGD with a fixed uh, step size, then you know that you can get within a, a small area uh, around the, the minimizer, say if you have a convex problem at least, um, and the radius of that region depends on the step size. So now you shrink the step size and you get closer to the minimizer. So that's why you see the jump here. Is, Very is good. it a decision of the user or it's automatically done? Um, in most examples, it's a decision by the user. Um, so you can see here, I mean, coincidentally, they chose 150 and I think 250. Yeah. So you pick some even numbers that, that you like and maybe have some experience with this. Um, I would say that is also one area where more science would uh, would be needed it's an incredibly difficult problem though if you if you start thinking about how to make these decisions automatically um, i think in most practitioners that i've observed and uh, um, that well, the expertise that we have built up is uh, you kind of want to look at this blue curve here so you see that at some point you don't make progress so this means that you probably are in the region of conversion and you're just bouncing around so then you can just go in and, and, and decrease the step size. And there are a few you know, heuristics that uh, odd, some, somewhat make this process a bit more automatic. Some controls, basically. Yeah, because I mean, you can think about uh, analyzing sort of how much the progress has been over the last few epochs and then making decisions based on that. But it's, um, yeah, I, unfortunately, like it's, it's pretty much ad hoc. Um, there is actually the, the joke that people give about SGD. Um, um, do you know what this stands for? Anyone? So the joke is that it's called for it's called for student uh, so graduate student descent. No, it's actually G GSD. Sorry. Um, ah, okay, GSD. And, um, okay. Yeah, GSD versus SGD. Um, and um, unfortunately, and uh, that's you know something I think that's also a motivation for us doing this work in terms of the modeling. The idea is to have graduate students do more meaningful work. And so, but in, in that regard, you know, if we, if we, for example, figure out the modeling, if we have better models, then typically we observe the optimization also does not depend so much on these hyperparameters that you need to pick. And um, that way you kind of replace a little bit of this experimental time with, uh, with thinking and uh, kind of looking at what you're doing. But that's, that's a great question actually, Francesco, because there is a lot more that can be said about these things once you, once you start uh, experimenting with these methods. And it's, uh, it's a big open problem actually too. It's not as nice, I would say, I come from parameter estimation, 
like uh, think about Gauss Newton type methods for for picking this this uh, theta and there is a much clearer path in terms of what choices you make and we are working on 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 uh, deterministic optimization methods too we actually have some recent work on that as well that allow to train these networks but it's um, it has different difficulties that we can get into maybe later um, okay many, um, many thanks okay sure and also thanks for asking a question it's always good if someone asks questions um, okay so now after this little break let's go from uh, PDs to deep learning. So what will change? So this ODE perspective pretty much is agnostic to what data set you work on. So you can do this for any sort of data set. I chose a point cloud example, but you can also treat other things. Uh, I did not use any characteristics of the data. So the PDE motivation really comes from imaging. And if you look at imaging, like a, like a classical example I had on my slide was image classification. So think about the classical work of um, digit recognition from the 90s. Uh, how did people think about digit recognition back then? So you have these, these grayscale images and you convolve them with filters to sort of extract interesting features. That was Jan LeCun's uh, landmark work in, in there. And that leads you to now convolutional neural networks, which you can obtain by replacing these linear operators that I showed you, the Ks on my slides. You replace them now, instead of having like big matrices that have the number of pixels by number of pixels, you replace that with a convolution operator that is parameterized by the stencil. And then you are learning the weights of the stencil. Okay, so it's usually successful in speech, image, and video data. Um, today, challenges are beyond digital recognition, which is a so done deal, like the po post office is probably using that in Italy as well as in the US. Um, now, I think top-notch questions are semantic segmentation, for example. You think about a street scene here in London, um, and you want to label every pixel in that image. And you want to do this probably in real time, so that in a self-driving car, the car always knows what is the street and what is a pedestrian, so it knows where to go. Um, and here now, you know, you think that like, it's really game changer in terms of uh, what you need to do, because you, you not only have to decide one class for the whole image, you have to de decide for every single pixel. Um, and also the data is much more complex because it can be really messy. Uh, typically the data is acquired while people are driving in a car. Uh, it's a really, really difficult uh, problem. Uh, some key challenges are um, you have about uh, now go from R2, like our blue and white, blue and red dots, you go to 700,000 inputs. Uh, you also don't have two classes, you have maybe 32 classes in this example. Then if you think about the convolutions, um, the convolution matrices are based on comparing local information. And um, th think about the PDE, for example, an explicit PDE solver needs many time, step, time steps to transfer information. And the same holds for convolutions. You need many, many, many layers uh, that are also very expensive. So you really think of, uh, about that. Uh, you need efficiency and also you need robustness because um, like a letter that is sent to the wrong address is okay, terrible, but it's not as bad as if a car running over a pedestrian. So you really have to be robust also. And um, you need uh, lots of computing power in this area, storage, and I would claim also new ideas. And those ideas uh, I think come from, uh, for me, uh, from PDEs, because I, I'm, for example, in my PhD, I did a lot of PDE-based image processing, and it's a usually inspiring field if you think about it, because image processing did exist before the work of, say, Osha and and uh, and Sethian and all, and everyone who has con contributed to to that uh, to that uh, uh, PDE-based imaging uh, area. Um, and we are trying to sort of start small and do something similar in deep learning, uh, where you can think about designing the CNN so that it inherits a few properties of PDEs. Um, and um, there, what we found is that you can look, for example, at CNNs and design them so that they mimic parabolic PDEs. What I mean by that is that you treat the convolution operators as a discrete differential operator, but you're not sure about like it's a first order, second order, and so on. And if you make a, a few choices in the ResNet, so you restrict the structure, you actually get systems that, for example, diminish energy like a parabolic system. And you can, you can show that, that, as you would expect for a parabolic equation, that it's very stable with respect to perturbations of the inputs. 
Um, but it's you know non-linear, non-autonomous, so things get a little bit more more difficult here. Um, you can also design resonates that are hyperbolic, so they uh, preserve energies and use um, symplectic integrators, which can allow you to go forward and backward through the network in a stable way. So unlike neural ODEs, where the backward path recomputes the feature maps in an unstable way, here you make the specific choice to limit yourself to hyperbolic dynamics and thereby with right time integrator actually get a simple and, uh, and efficient way to recompute the weights. So you can save tons of memory in the training uh, with a little bit of computational overhead. Um, and um, yeah, what interestingly what we found is that these different PDEs all pretty much perform competitively when trained well. So um, that is that is important, of course, because in the end of the day, when if we want to establish these these techniques, we need to show um, results that are as good as as a normal ResNet. We can debate on what good is in terms of accuracy versus insight. Um, but um, yeah, they are quite competitive actually. And with the ResNet, since you train all the weights, you actually don't know what you're in for. So you may have a system for some choices of weights. It's a parabolic PDE, sometimes a hyperbolic PDE, sometimes it's neither, and then it changes maybe halfway through. And so that is um, kind of our philosophy here to a priori decide, okay, I want to solve a hyperbolic uh, system. I discretize it as knowing that it's a hyperbolic system, so not with forward Euler, but with a symplectic integrator, and then take it from there. So to show you a few examples, of, I like looking at dog images, of course. So you have uh, the true label and basically all of the different networks that I, that I talked about here pretty much give you, I mean, they give you different predictions, but they all pretty much figure out that this is a dog. Um, so this work also has sparked quite a few improvements, some by our group, some by others. Uh, one noteworthy one that, that we've done at some point is we trained on a single GPU, um, an image classification method with uh, 1,200 layers. Um, not necessarily because you need 1,200 layers for this problem, but just to show that we can eliminate all the memory in the training and, and pull this off. Um, so then you can also think about you know, semi-implicit time-stepping schemes. Uh, we, one thrust together with Iran tries this group is uh, to reduce the number of weights in the convolutional neural network because uh, they are actually quite uh, data energy and, and weight hungry. Uh, so we've done some work on that. Um, and on a related node, actually, um, also some of those CN, like CD, CNN PD connections you can now uh, also, with knowing what you know now, see in the 90s. And also, um, of course, this paper by, by Chen and Pock actually is an image processing paper where they're also training these uh, PDE models, which now gets a, I mean, maybe that's also a trend uh, for, for you, like to train reconstruction algorithms and so on. So that's, uh, that's a nice interface actually to these deep learning methods that are, are a nice alternative also to these black box uh, machine learning methods that you can find. So that's um, the PDE world. And I will say again that, you know, it of course also builds up on the ODE part in the sense that you have a continuous time dynamics, but now you have also a continuous space because you abstract the convolution operators into differential operators. Um, and it's, it's geared, of course, because you have this convolution operator in there, it's geared to image or speech or video data. It's not applicable for any data set that you have. Um, okay, um, summary, and then we can take many questions. Um, so my goal was to really highlight a few connections between PDEs and ODEs and deep learning. Um, hopefully I, I kind of succeeded with that. Uh, sorry for not going into the opposite direction. I said that it's a different talk. I think I have, have even recordings to share if you are interested. Um, and I want to correct, first of all, the statement from earlier from my CS colleagues. Um, there's a missing piece in this equation that is really mathematics, because um, in the end of the day, we really need to understand deep learning much better in order to uh, you know, use it or to not use it um, in, in real life applications. Uh, we really covered the direction from PDE to deep learning. What we did not cover are many, many things, and I want to disclose a few. So take the other direction we did not cover. Um, it's interesting, it's very interesting. Actually, that's part of my, 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 my projects right now. We did not talk about uh, many other forms of learning. We only talked about supervised learning. So think about 
also un unsupervised, semi-supervised, reinforcement learning, active learning, all these things are very interesting, of course, uh, important because these techniques are being used and also have, have ties to applied mathematics. So reinforcement learning, for example, has, has ties to optimal control and active learning has, has um, ties to um, optimal experimental design and so on. Um, and they are usually interested. And of course, I think here are some of the experts on say unsupervised learning, like graph structures and similarity um, measures and so on. So those are really important fields as well that I think are driven by applied math uh, at this point. Um, the interesting part I think will be deep learning plus PDEs. So, you know, can you combine data and models in new ways? Because I mean, of course, you know, if you have a PDE, you have a PDE, you're, you're in good shape. You, you can use a PDE to do simulations. You can use a PDE to make decisions, but not all interesting processes in the world give you a clean PDE model that you know it's true. So can you kind of augment that with, with data? I think will be is one interesting area to look at. Uh, more on an educational level, since I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teaching duty as well at, at Emory, is it's actually an interesting question also, how do you make people from deep learning and PDE talk more? In a, in a curriculum. So how do you get applied mathematicians become more knowledgeable in, in deep learning, which I mean, is a very advanced field where many things already are working surprisingly well. Um, so it's not like one field I would want to pick over, over another in terms of sophistication and advancements and, and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, that's also one mission I have. So we have dedicated classes and we work from the undergrad level up uh, with all different sorts of, of, of people. Um, and then, yeah, I want to, uh, you know, end with questions, but also, you know, shameless plug for if you are interested and uh, if you want to join Emory, it's a fantastic uh, place for many things and many activities specifically in this region. So we, we are working with uh, computational math and data science is a big theme in the math department now. And, you know, we have, uh, like, name it, whatever you're interested in, we can take temporary students, postdocs, faculty, whatever. Um, so email me if that's an option. Um, and uh, you have great examples here in the room. Alex, for example, is a former PhD student of ours. And you have many people in the region and former students of yours working, for, working with us. And that's great. So um, anyway, I want to stop here and hopefully take a few more questions and then have a, have a nice discussion. But uh, thanks again, Francesco, for the nice, nice uh, invitation and for the opportunity to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I wish uh, the opportunity was, was really to have you here in, in presence, but it was really next time. nice. Uh, nice sorry, next time, yes. Um, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. Um, we have uh, time uh, for questions, of course. So, yeah. Please, uh, anybody from the audience has any comments? And arguments, too. You know, I also like I, to argue I, with people what yeah. people want. So. <laughs> Maybe I can start off with just uh, like a basic uh, question, sort of like uh, the, 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 behind the whole thing. So uh, it is not completely clear to me uh, what is the res net. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I can show you what a res net is. Um, so if you take an artificial intelligence class, then my assumption is you have seen the multi-layer perceptron. Yeah, it's a classical Rosenblatt, whatever yeah. um, model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you look at my slide here, you can see through a classical perceptron model yeah. if you if you remove the u zero plus yeah. h time. Okay. And 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 uh, maybe also the sigma can be different, can it be? Yeah, the sigma can be different. I mean, that's the same thing in a ResNet. You, you can pick different sigmas if you like. That's not ah, the main ah, thing. Ah, okay. I mean, the, the main the main difference there. Sorry, sorry about that. I mean, kind of had to rush through a little bit. Uh, the main difference that that there is between um, or the main innovation in the ResNet yeah. is really this U zero plus. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, that is called in machine learning. They call it a skip connection. Okay. Um, and. Um, you know, one way to motivate it and also the name residual neural network is that if you if you add this here, then what you're basically learning is the update. So you're learning the residual between U0 and U0. U um, and that has a few implications. So for example, if you take a multi-layer perceptron model that does not have this uh, skip connection mm -hmm. and try to learn the mapping f of x equal to x, that can be really tricky because of the activation functions that you have in there. If you do this with a, with a ResNet, that's a piece of cake. I mean, you pick yeah. all the weights equal to zero and you're, you're there. So in that sense, that's you know, 
uh, like a silly motivation of why that is an important work, but just empirically, these things have been working so well across so many different tasks that uh, they are important. And then the age, of course, is something that I put. The original paper, so that's so coming out of Microsoft, uh, they have age equal to one. So you have a forward Euler scheme with a step size of one. What could go wrong? Um, yeah, but um, that, that uh, you know, I had to put forth the other part. But that's the main difference, yes. And didn't you say also at some point that, that these were successful when uh, you have many layers? Did I get that? No. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now if you, why, especially why, if, you, if you, there? can you give a word? Yeah, I can give you some intuition about that. So if you, if you know multi-layer perceptrons, mm -hmm. then you know, for example, so say you have trained it and you have trained it to an okay level, but you're not happy. What are your options? You want to add more weights. And if you add, for example, another layer, my guess would be that hell breaks loose because you add another layer and that does a random transformation of the whole data set and you know whatever i mean it's not always clear that with more layers for example i mean yes yes you become more expressive in principle but uh, it's going to be a very hard training problem or initialization problem to do smart decisions in there and that's been an observation in deep learning also where when you add more layers to multi-layer perceptron uh, training can become unstable quite quickly just think about uh, matrix powers uh, can, can sum up really quickly um, and um, and very unpredictable with say a, a 20 layer uh, network and a, and a 40 layer network i mean how do you even get there there are results in this original paper here where, where they kind of do these tricks so where, or observations you train them and you see that the larger network performs more poorly even on the training data and that's that's mm -hmm. difficult so in here uh, especially when you have the perspective of a differential equation. So if you add, what is a layer? A layer you can interpret here as, as being a time step of your ODE solver. So you're kind so of looking you at have a, a long term. Yeah, so if you have, a, I, I, sorry, not long term, it's a finite time horizon, um, typically. Uh -huh. But you have a finite time horizon, you know, if you have 20 or 40 or 80 time steps, the system will behave differently. You have more flexibility in terms of changing the dynamics. But you have, if you have at least uh, more or less a well-posed uh, problem in, 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 at, at your hands, you have a way to, for example, initialize the weights. Um, and that's, uh, you know, ideas that we've been using also to, we call it multi-level training. So you start with few weights and uh, then you go to more weights and introduce them, uh, them later. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, a, that's a, I think, a really excellent question here because that's an important uh, trend i think in these in these areas to to use these architectures and i will say the motivation for computer scientists is mainly because they work so nice and you know they have empirical observations where you know the loss function really looks looks much better um this is yeah, to, okay, yeah. yeah loss, loss function on, on a, see, the same loss function on on a resnet yeah so, so this is of course you know an anecdotal example i pulled from from this paper that this does actually quite a nice job to because you immediately start thinking i mean this is a high dimension optimization problem like how do you even plot these things yeah and look in this is in this paper for how they how, how the sausage is made but um, from our experience also in training these networks is that if you make the right choices here in terms of the stability, good time integration, you typically do better in the training um, and you have an easier life there. Okay. Whereas with multilayer perceptrons, it's, it's a bit more tricky. And they don't have an interpretation also as differential equations. And, uh, yeah, um, yeah, of course. Yeah. So that's you know, a biased applied mathematician's uh, no, no, I mean, I, uh, reason I, I, for, I, like, I for liking this them. Is, uh, this is a, a good bias to have. <laughs> All right. Yeah, at least in this room, it, it should be. <laughs> at least in this room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the question: uh, If you have, uh, for example, that uh, there are some invariance properties, I don't know. For example, uh -huh. the part, the the set has some spirality or rotational invariance if these are patterns. So. So what is the typical way of proceeding? You embed the invariance properties in the, let's say, perceptron, multi-layer perceptron in the network, or you associate a sort of constraints to the ODE, have DAEs. What is the 
the the correct way to proceed if you want or you leave simply the network to learn these invariants of the module yeah so you put me on the spot here because uh first of all there are so many different approaches i will not be able to pick a, the correct way Maybe one. Uh, Maybe if it one. if it exists um so i think you, i mean you mentioned a really uh, important issue here too how do you preserve for example symmetries or some properties that you know and there yeah. it's been a, a, a studied problem uh, for 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 years i think most recently what i've been looking at uh, and following is what's called equivariant neural networks um that i think have also uh, continuous interpretations that are going to be important here to uh, to understand um it's not something i've actively worked on so i, I can't tell you like how how well these things work but of course there are also the other options for example if you think about the first layer here as an embedding um yeah. to sort of use that to encode in a, in a smart way these invariances and i think in the kernel methods uh, there are already some things to build up on some ideas yeah. um, what i will think everyone would agree and definitely is my standpoint is to just leave it to the neural network to learn these things uh, is maybe not so promising because i mean like I imagine. we have uh, put a lot of effort into analyzing these systems to learn how they work uh, why would we want to torture the neural network to learn the same thing from scratch again and um you know it's like i come from a field also what, what i like to to use in pds is like mimetic uh, methods i always like to use a mimetic method even if it's maybe only first order mm -hmm. um because it preserves the properties that i know from the continuous world in the discrete world and that's i think also the kind of the goal that i would have here that you encode these properties so that they hold for any any choices of weights or at least uh, within the feasible set um, and then and then do that, but this is a, I think that's a question. So equivariant networks. I don't know if anyone has looked at them. I think they are more or less come can, becoming more popular, and more prominent in the last two three years. So it's a relatively recent uh, trend. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You're welcome. I ask a further question. Of course. Uh, so uh, as also recall here, or maybe at the slide before, so this ResNet uh, neural network is a, an Euler, uh, a sort of Euler uh, forward propagation. Yeah. Uh, maybe you said it at some point, but uh, I didn't get it. Does it make any sense to use like a, a multi-step, uh, uh, doing an, anal an analogy with Adam Bashford, for example, yeah. doing a sort of multi-step uh, in the sense uh, uh, enlarging the stencil in the in the coupling in between, uh, for example, uh, U two with U one, U one and U zero also. Yeah, yeah, of, of, of course. I mean, like, uh, so I, I think I put a few references here on, on, on the slide. I think the paper that I know best in this realm is this Lou paper here that has you know, yeah. many different top, uh, types of time integrators. So. Like had I given this talk four years ago, which was when we right were starting, I, I think I even had a slide like this, like uh, uh, make your own neural network, you know, open up a numerical analysis textbook that I like to recommend, like the one by by my friends, Hen Greif and Ryasha, you know, pick chapter nine or whatever, what is it and, and code all your neural networks. And definitely, so it's something I think what, I, what we know by now is that it depends really on the context of the learning problem. So it's not, and I also want to be clear that the ResNet is not a forward, uh, forward order approximation. You can interpret it as one, yeah, it has a size sure. of one, and so on. So, and and then the other thing, especially in this in this audience here, is like the ODE is not first principle motivated. And that's what we realize also by our experiments. We can change the ODE completely from parabolic to hyperbolic and still get pretty much the same result in different ways. Um, so. And in that sense, like in, say, if you ask me about classification, the role of the time integrator in my experiments, I have not seen as being too important. Um, oh, but, but that is exactly the, the, the point because we have some, uh, of course, a classical experience about the role of uh, uh, having a, a multi-step method, but here it, it, it's a different uh, problem. So there is an analogy, as you were saying. So I was curious to know if there, so I, yeah. I, I mean, in a classical OD, we know what to expect if you increase the, uh, for example, the, the number of steps so you expect to, to gain accuracy and lose stability, for example. But, but here it's, yeah. it's another joke. So uh, for this, I was curious to know. Yeah. Um, so I, I, these, thing, these choices become more important when you use this neural ODE framework 
for solving problems that actually have a time dependency. So we've been using those for high dimensional optimal transport problems, for example, dynamical optimal transport, where you actually have a real time that is evolving. And, and there, the role of the time integrator was crucial for us because otherwise we did not get the accuracy that we would need to solve the problem and to get, in, get accurate gradients. But in classification, you realize at the time, I mean, it loosely corresponds to the depth of the network, which both are sort of artificial concepts. Um, and uh, I mean, numerically, I, mean, I, I think we did see no harm in, for example, replacing the Ford Euler with the, with the fourth order Ranjakata method. Um, often, I mean, sometimes we saw slightly better convergence. Sometimes we saw the same convergence. And when you when you adjust for the fact that it's more expensive, and similar for Adam Bashforth, I mean, it's uh, pretty much uh, they performed for us not remarkably better. This paper, I think, has a few examples, and it also you have to realize it's always uh, depending on what example you're using, what data set are you using, what learning algorithm are you using, what step size are you using. All of these things com combined sometimes make this uh, the water a bit more muddy, uh, but that paper I think was a bit more optimistic in terms of the role of, of the different time integrators. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Do you control the step size? Um, I told you my, my idea, like with the discretized optimize, I control the step size in the sense that I pick it a priori and pick a priori. then yeah. So. Yeah, because that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the discussion that we can have about optimized discretized, where you really treat the problem as a continuous uh, control problem. Yeah. You can use adaptive forward and backward, or you, you, you treat it on a discrete level. And we've made best experiments or experiences with the discrete level for many reasons. So we pick it a priori, seem to pick it reasonably. If things blow up, you pick a smaller time step, but it's um, not like completely we don't have a completely fleshed out uh, adaptive method or, or sophisticated way of picking the step size. Because, because I was wondering if one can control it just by imposing uh, the decrease of the function that you are minimizing, which is the error. Um, so if the, if, the, if the step decreases it, maybe you can increase the step size. If otherwise you see that it stagnates, then maybe you can reduce it in order to better follow the scale. I wonder. Um, I that's, um, probably, a, yeah, it's a, definitely something to think more about um, and we can chat more about it. One thing I will say that sometimes you run into with these uh, choices is, you know, your loss function here yeah, yeah. May, may not be the right indicator of how well you're actually doing in the continuous world because it's, a, it's computed using a discrete dynamics. So you may may sometimes what we I call it overfitting in terms of discretization. Yeah, so yeah, say yeah. I use only two time steps, then yeah. my network can do fantastic things that it's not supposed it's not to be able to do and get to a lower loss value. So sometimes we have one example actually in the optimal transport example again, where we See. use a poor time integration. And based on the loss function, this is a terrific result. And you look at the images and they just look like garbage. And the reason is because yeah, yeah. you're looking at a discrete, uh, uh, you're fooled in some sense, or we were fooled by this discrete uh, estimate of the, of the objective function. Yeah. So that's something you'll be careful with. But, uh, but yeah, you know, there are ways in optimal control, of course, also in discrete has optimized to, um, to, to make these kind of type of choices uh, based on residuals, based on sensitivities and so on. And so it's, um, you know, we've put out the framework. So now I think we can all, and that's something also a uh, way to generate research projects uh, has been for us in the last couple of years to yeah. look into the control literature to see kind of what, what has been done for similar problems. Um, sure. And um, I, I guess that will still remain some a job guarantee for applied mathematicians in the next few years. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> That's what we need. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question or comment? Maybe, maybe I, you know, I, I'm going to abuse my role and, and ask directly. I have two more questions if I can. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so one is, actually uh, connected to what you said before. No, we, we are looking at the uh, fixed time window. 
why is it that and how do you choose that if ah. it's an intuition or... yes uh, that's a very good question uh, that is important to address in the applied math concept or co context here um, and I want to be provocative and say that here it's not it's meaningless to look at the asymptotic limit of the system um, in the sense that so well, wait, sorry, I did not want to jump here so the, for two reasons so think about again, again maybe on this slide I can show it to you so you N is basically your approximation of the OD solution at U of capital T. That's a time, finite time. The goal that you still have here is at some point that you use a, a, an affine model to classify red or blue. You need to make this decision. That's the ultimate goal. And uh, the transition from U, U1 to UN, you can think about it as like a mapping or morphing in, in the in the feature space so the points you can uh, some of them like visualizing them as a movie where the red points go to one corner and the blue points go to the other corner then you fit your linear model in between and you are good to go okay um, mm -hmm. so it, it, there is a finite time horizon after which you want to make this decision after which you want the separability in the, in the data set so if you look at the asymptotic limit also, so think about, um, you know, talk about parabolic networks, for example, there you actually, it's really crucial that you have a finite time horizon because in the long run, everything will go to, to zero basically. Yeah. Mm. So now think about the, the job of, of this last layer here, which is sort of your linear classifier, um, blue points, red points, everything is at zero. And like, how do you make a decision now? So there's kind of crucial yeah, to I think see. about it as a, as a finite time control problem. But is there any, I mean, like, uh, does it change anything if you change that uh, T, the capital T? I mean, of course, of course. Um, and that's you kind can... of uh, depends on the problem. It's kind of. Uh, yeah, it's, it's again, it's coming, no, what people call a hyperparameter. And you can uh, see some differences. So also when it comes now to activation functions, for example, if you pick the ReLU function, then the choice of t shouldn't matter because you can absorb the h and the scaling of the as a one homogeneous function so you can pull the h in so uh, basically um, there's a redundancy between the size of h and the size of the entries in k right. you can rescale it to anything you like in this example where you have the sigmoid um, the finite time tends to be a bit more important yes how do you pick it it's similar to picking how many layers you use um it's um uh, you know we typically found though that it's not the most important parameter so yeah we can pick something and then one thing we look at for example if you if you are able to solve your ode really well if you're able to minimize get to a local minimizer in the loss function but you're not happy with how expressive sort of your network is the accuracy you achieve why not try to pick a different and a larger number but yeah Again, they are also, you know, someone has a good idea of, I think there are nice works in optimal control about estimating stopping times, which is basically the, the analog here for T. Um, that can also be a, a good direction to look at. All right, good, thank you. <laughs> maybe, maybe I add- Someone keeping tabs here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, MVP, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Um, Anyway, if you have like one more minute, I wanted to ask you the yeah, sure. thing about the stability thing that you mentioned, uh, um, this result of robustness. So there, um, what I'm thinking is, um, so you, what, what does it mean you to have stability in the forward model? So you. Uh, uh, so let me ask you this. So you see this learning problem here written down. Yes. What would it mean if the forward model was not stable? Hey, okay, yes. Maybe. So that's more my point of view. So I don't know, maybe are there people who have experienced inverse problems? So that's where I grew up in, in my PhD. So in an inverse problem, typically you don't even ask because the, the assumption is that your forward model is well posed. It's the inverse that is ill posed. So you talk about regularization and difficulties in solving the inverse problem, but we always assume that the forward problem is well posed because if it's not well posed, uh, then you typically say it's a meaningless problem to solve because it can mean that small perturbations in the Y will give you dramatically different outputs, which means 
the choice of weights most likely would also be be dramatic have to be dramatically different different right so that's kind of yeah, a, that was kind of our take yeah. in the paper to you know really start that's why it's such a in some ways it's such a basic question that we're asking is uh, under which conditions how should i design my network so that my forward problem at least makes sense i mean before we even talk about you know, how well we can learn and uh, how, how, how things behave. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And then of course you can also think about this in terms of adversarial attacks where you, know, people, you probably know this image with, with the uh, yeah, yeah, koala yeah. bear and you know, add a little bit of noise and then it becomes completely misclassified and so on. And that is an instability because I mean, think about numerical analysis 101. I mean, you have a tiny. Yeah, I was thinking if that kind of attack they, has like a small norm, or if instead exactly of like yeah, a you, point. Uh, especially in computer vision, you have many of these examples where the yeah. noise that is added, you look at it with the human eye, and you don't see a difference between image A and image B, but they have completely different labels. Okay. And it's a huge problem if you think about uh, real application of these techniques. Cool. More questions? Oh. Maybe once you start, once you stop the recording. Alex, how is the weather in, in Savannah today? Oh, it's uh, 